By now, we've learned a little bit about the scientific method and how a researcher formulates a hypothesis and tests it. Now, let's talk about how the science makes its way from the lab and into the hands of the public. I've enlisted some experts and a bit of humor for us to go through this topic together. As you can see depicted in this comic here, the researcher is only present at the beginning of the process. Once her results are published, it's goodbye science and hello science media. You'll note that the faceless media and the internets are the culprits here. They take the science and shred it, passing it to and fro like a football from one outlet to another until it becomes something unrecognizable at the end of the cycle. Though at the end, it has been simplified into something that even the researcher's grandmother can relate to and understand. So obviously, we're using this exaggeration to have a bit of fun here. And while this is fun, there's also a truth behind every villain or exaggeration that I think we can all relate to. Who hasn't heard a good story that seemed too good to be true and come to find out the oversimplified version of what we heard was in fact too good to be true? So we can use this comic as a model to have a laugh, but we can also use it to go a little deeper and think about what happens behind the scenes at some of these critical points. So let's begin here at the beginning with the researcher. We all know that research has to occur before there's research to report on. How, though, does a researcher decide what to publish and what to share? After all, not every scientific innovation or experiment is written up. So what scientists have to say on the topic may surprise you. Here's Dr. Hugh Jones from Rothamsted Research in the UK talking about his work on the Wiffy wheat plant. Well, so let's distinguish between an experiment that that succeeds in forming a conclusion. So the experiment worked, it went to term, we, could, we, could, we saw the results, they were valid, and we could make a conclusion. And the conclusion was, in this case, the aphids weren't being repelled. And that's different from having an experiment that, that has a conclusion that you don't like. And, and this is what we had. We had an experiment that went to term, we concluded, and okay, it wasn't the conclusion that we wanted, that we hoped for, but it was an important conclusion because it's, it stops this whole process being repeated again if you can publish the results. Um, and it also means that you know, every experiment you do in the lab uh, isn't necessarily turned into a successful field experiment. There's a lot of differences between what happens in the field, the real world of, of agriculture, and the very controlled um, environment of the lab. As Dr. Jones noted, though his experiment didn't end with the conclusion he hoped for, it was still an important conclusion. But publishing negative results in science isn't necessarily something news outlets look for. Dr. Jones's colleague, Dr. John Pickett, talks more about publishing the results of that study. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to publish so-called negative results? Well, this uh, series of experiments had uh, achieved tremendous interest uh, by the public and by the media. And uh, after all, they also pay for it. Uh, and so we felt obliged to publish it in an open access journal, rigorously scientifically reviewed, but nonetheless so that anybody could read it. We didn't want to conceal what we'd done because we'd learned from it. We hoped people would see how science generally had learned from it. Um, I think it's essential that when you have something like this, you do publish it because it's slightly more difficult because journals like to publish new positive results every time. So we probably didn't get it in the highest impact journal that we would have got it into if it had worked in the field. But nonetheless, it's in a very good journal. It was peer reviewed very heavily. It took quite a while actually to publish it because the reviewers, they said, surely there must have been some difference in the wheat plants. This pathway to make the alarm pheromone, with it relating to the biosynthesis of chlorophyll. Surely it will have uh, some difference uh, in, in what it does to the plant. So we had to get some more evidence. We knew it didn't, but some of it was us knowing rather than us having put it all down uh, in, um, in statistically significant data. Uh, that was not an inadequacy on our part. It, it did look so obvious that there was no difference. But we did some extra work then to make sure that the publication could demonstrate that we hadn't crippled the plant, as it were, by producing the alarm pheromone in the plant. So we've heard from the scientists. 
but how do organizations decide which of the multiple stories that come their way every day do they want to pick up? Well, unlike what this comic would make us think, it isn't just the splashiest science. Nick Perkins runs an organization called SciDevNet that has original reporting on science from all over the world. And here's his approach to selecting science reporting. The way that we go about picking the stories that we think are really important for the public or for policy audiences or development practitioners to be aware of is to look really at the impact or the consequence, the implications of this particular research breakthrough or of this particular technological innovation. What's the scale of people who would be potentially affected by this? Um, but we also look at the severity of the impact. So sometimes it's not necessarily about numbers, like uh, some kind of epidemic or, in fact, ways to, to contain epidemics, but it also could be about the severity. So actually it might be around a particular issue where we know that it could affect quite precisely vulnerable communities. So the media looks to one another for what stories to feature and what to pick up. This is a critical part of the news cycle. But behind every science media piece is someone, a journalist, who's trying to convey what the science is really all about in terms that we can all understand and relate to. And it's a tough job. Let's hear from Tamar Haspel of the Washington Post on what it's like to be a science journalist. I think that, you know, it is a challenge writing about genetic engineering because there is a vocal minority on, on both sides of of this fence and there is a large proportion of people who don't know about it, who don't care about it, yet I write for a general interest audience. Um, and what I have to do, I think, to make that topic relevant to people is to try and give readers a basic understanding of these issues without going really far into the weeds and without, you know, trying to arbitrate this, this minority versus minority fight. Because the issues are a little more straightforward than either minority would have you believe. And on and on this cycle goes, where a scientist writes research, provides results, and then the media picks it up. But as we've explored, there's a lot that goes into the work that happens from the lab to the public. So next time you hear a story, that might be too good to be true, go ahead and dig a little deeper to find out what the real story is. What is the science trying to communicate? And in this module on science communication and evaluating resources, we're going to give you some tools to do just that.